You know, I got a birthday next week. I'll be 78. And uh, we're still kicking. I've had three near-death experiences. And then, you know, when I was young, we used to call something a near-death experience when you know, a car just missed you or somebody shot at you in a bullet. That was a near miss, right? So we called different different uh, connotation. But if you count those as near misses, I I've been shot up. I've been shot by a machine gun. You know, I took a round to the chest, to the heart. I mean, I've been blown up by a rocket. I've, I've, it's what, seven? At least seven helicopter crashes. Like, I might be exaggerating by one. I think one was just an engine failure and we crashed on the runway. That may not count. Uh, but I've fallen off two-story houses several times on my back on the cement. I've been in car crashes, motorcycle crashes. Uh, you name it, uh, it's happened. And yet, every day, I get up, just like a Timex watch. I'm still ticking, right? Take a licking, but still ticking. <laughs> Yeah, it just to, to, to set the stage on that, I was eight, eight and a half, and uh, I was sent home from school by my third grade teacher, and you know, because I'm really looking sick, you know. And so, anyway, by the time I end up getting to the uh, the doctor, the doctor put me in the hospital, and basically, the hospital, my stepfather and my, and my mother dropped me off at the hospital. Picture eight and a half years old versus how they treat people today. Eight and a half years old, they put me on a gurney. I wave goodbye to my parents and they leave. And I'm left at a hospital, which ended up being there for a year, one year of my life in this hospital. <laughs> Boom, you know, first time away from home. And then that first night, and I'm hearing conversations going on like, uh, you know, we think you brought him in too late. You know, we're not sure what we can do, you know, blah, blah. And I'm hearing this thinking, they're talking, they talk, are you talking to me? Are you talking about me? Hey. You know, anyway, so I'm, I'm laying in a gurney and they're, they're rolling you down a hall, you know, and they, they take me out to a isolation ward because I had a, a kidney disease, I had a lung disease, I had everything. It started off with a bad case of the mumps. See, that was like the gateway to, people don't realize you get the mumps uh, or you get strep throat, those are like gateways to other diseases. It just cascades. Uh, so that's what happens. So you don't take care of the mumps. And then next thing you know, you got strep throat. Next thing you know, you got pink eye or infections or whatever. So in this case, you went to the lungs and the, and the lungs were filling up with fluids. And uh, I had double pneumonia. And uh, and then the kidneys were uh, peeing blood, basically. It looked like blood coming out. So that was the first night. They, they take me in, they sit me in a chair, they take these big long needles. I mean, they were long and they stick them through your back and they got big, they're thick because they want to draw fluid out, right? So they're drawing all this fluid out of me and and, and nobody's holding my hand. No, There's no music, there's no, that's okay, kid. Nothing, it's just sit down, boom, shoot, they take the stuff out. And then they're done and they go, there's a bed over there, get into it, we'll see you in the morning. And. And then I hear him down the hall, if he makes it. I mean, it's like, what? What do you mean if he makes it? Nobody's sitting there with me. There's no machines hooked up to me to, to monitor me. I'm down at the end of the hall in this, this isolation ward, this old wood building. This is back with the wooden wheelchairs. I don't know if you've ever seen those movies with the wood wheelchairs, you know. Anyway, so I'm down here and they turn the lights off and there I am, first time away from home in total darkness. Like, what the hell's going on here, right? And, uh, and the next thing you know, this great pain that I have, the lungs and the kidneys. The kidneys, you get back pain and other pain. But, but it was like, there was a lot of pain. I was having trouble breathing. Then all of a sudden, there was no breathing. There was no pain. There was no respiratory ups and downs of the chest, you know, breathing. There was nothing. There was no heartbeat. There was anything. I, I was pain-free. And, and I feel... Light. When I say light, I mean light and weight, and also light, like the glow, light, like you know, lighting something up, lighting up the darkness. So I felt like both. I was light and light, L I G H T, and and the other. So I'm, I'm, I sense I'm drifting, floating, moving up, uh, and. The dark room starts getting a little lighter and a little lighter and a little lighter. And I I, I don't look down because you know this this consciousness of me doesn't have eyeballs or anything. I 
you know, it's just, but I, I am focused. I'm, I'm seeing a body, how I see a body. I, I see a body below me. And it was like, how oh, pitiful. I feel sorry for that, that body and that that's my body, but I feel sorry for it. <laughs> but I also knew that was my body, but that wasn't me. Even at that age, I knew the real me was this consciousness, this me thinking, feeling, sensing at this other level. That's the real me. It wasn't the body me. In fact, the body me was down there suffering and not moving. It was it was gone. And the, the real me was feeling very good about not being in that broken body. Because that broken body was going to be in the hospital, as it turns out. Another year and about seven years of treatment going you know, doctors and stuff. So I was really sick. So all of a sudden the room gets lighter, lighter, lighter. And it was like, I don't know if you ever flown in an airplane and look out the, and you're flying in the clouds, you see the clouds out there. Well, in Vietnam, I'm flying in the clouds. We had the doors off the helicopters on the Hueys. So if we went up through the clouds, the clouds were like inside. It's like you could touch the, you could reach out because that's something I wanted to do. Oh, I touch this cloud, right? It's like right here, you know? Um, so that's what it was like. It was like cloud bank. And then I see this panorama of events. I sensed it was my life. And I was normally you're, you're going to interview a lot of people. And what happens? They're kind of taken back to the decisions they made and how people are affected by all the stuff you do. They have a life review. I have a life preview going as it turns out 50 years to 58 and a half as it turns out I didn't know at the time but it was like but I saw I saw myself in a war flying around these funny looking helicopters that looked like tadpoles you know a Huey right you know look like a tadpole uh I didn't know where Vietnam was even at but I could see you know it was an Asian you know something was going on there and I saw myself behind a machine gun and I saw all the things. I saw who was going to get killed, who was going to get wounded, what was going to crash. Saw the woman in, in high school I met as a, as a girl. Uh, I knew I was going to marry her. I'm still married to her. <laughs> as we began this, I was, we were talking about hanging curtains in the, in the bedroom there. So, uh, yeah, we met in 1960. And I knew in 1960, at 14, we were both 14. I said, no, this is the girl I'm going to marry. But, you know, you don't tell somebody that, you know. So anyway, but we broke up in our senior year and uh, she went to Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. And I went to the University of Vietnam. <laughs> you know, there I am, you know, in war. So anyway, so I saw all these things. I included seeing the assassination of President Kennedy, but I didn't know who Kennedy was and and I, 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 I mentioned this because I told this story a couple of years ago during COVID. I told this story about the Kennedy assassination. And in my vision of this Kennedy assassination, there was more than one shooter. Facebook put me in Facebook jail for conspiracy. <laughs> and I had to think, uh, and they posted a thing about the Warren Commission says there was only one shooter. You know, anything else is a conspiracy. And I'm going, Really? I'm just expressing what I dreamt, saw, and had a vision, and yet it was like, anyway, so I'm just forewarning you. Uh, so <laughs> when I was in high school, senior year, uh, November 22nd is when the assassination happened. But two weeks prior to that, I'm telling the school principal, I'm telling other teachers, I'm telling people, I said, the president's gonna get shot and killed in Dallas, Texas. Yeah, I said, no, I, I've seen it. I mean, I've seen it already, you know, years before and in deja vu, I know it's coming. And uh, and then when it happened, of course, people kind of, they don't know what to say, they're kind of quiet. I found that out when I was in Vietnam and I was telling people, you know, this guy's gonna get killed, that aircraft's gonna crash, this bump. And when it happens, people get spooked. So, so telling people things, you have to be really careful, number one. Number two, if you can't change their destiny and it's not your destiny, Sometimes they're better left unsaid. Sometimes it's I mean, if you were going to die tomorrow, what would you get if I told you? You know, and there's always that one out of a thousand times that I could be wrong too, you know, who knows? So anyway, so that happened on the first one. 
And while I was in the hospital, I was, uh, I, I remember reading a book. Uh, it was read to me, uh, Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda. It was written in 1946. And in that book, he talks about this great avatar, Babaji, who go, comes to this cave where this guy's at. And he reintroduces a lost form of meditation called Kriya Yoga. And that was in 1860s or 40s or something. And anyway, and I was so fascinated by that story. So I'm laying there in that hospital for one year. One year. Now picture this. No smartphone. No dumb phone. No phone. No television. No books. No radio, no record player, no toys, no coloring books, no, no pads to write on and scribble. And 70 to 80% of the time, there wasn't anybody else in a room with me. I was all day by myself except for meals and getting shots. Uh, and once a week on a Sunday, usually my stepdad and my mother would come by and uh, they spend about 10 minutes and I was there for Christmas and Easter and Thanksgiving and birthday and all the holidays. And if a year doesn't sound like a long time, try a year with absolutely no form of entertainment other than yourself. Bed rest, you're not allowed to walk around or scoot around. You have to stay in the bed. Uh, and you didn't have any major conversations. All the conversation was medical, basically. How you feeling? You know, that was it. And then boom. So there was no stimulus. And a lot of people would say, that was a terrible thing. And I'm saying, absolute best thing ever happened to me because it was like being a child monk. It was like I was in my own ashram. It was like, you know, my own monastery, right? And I'd lay there and I would, I was making up different meditations. I thought I was making them up. And, uh, and I found out later on when I, I made a, my first trip to India. We'll talk about that because that deals with my secondary death experience. I found out that I wasn't making things up, but I didn't know. And uh, and then I learned why I was laying there about energy and yoga and all this kind of stuff, which I later used to heal my dog that was run over by a car. And, uh, and that's what I'm doing now, in case you're wondering. I go around the world, literally around the world. I'll be in Europe this next month. And... Uh, I, I, I teach self-healing because all healing is from the source. It, oh, I'm a healer. No, you're not. The source is. It, you're just helping people to get there. That's like the reservoir of water, right? And you're thirsty in your kitchen. You got a tap. You turn it on. The water's there. Well, I'm just the pipe. I'm not the water. Just the pipe. So I help get people connected with their own inner inner self, their own source. Anyway, so that was the first near-death experience. We could talk about that an hour and a half, but we want to talk about three. So we're going to kind of skip ahead there. There's one thing that happened, which comes up on this second near-death experience. That first near-death experience, as I'm seeing this life preview, I'm seeing two numbers of 29, and then the two would flip over. And you flip over two, looks upside down, looks like a five. You know, you flip it right, two, five, it's upside down. So I kept seeing 29, 59, I'm going. But intuitively, I kind of felt that I, I got to take care of myself. For some reason, maybe there's a good chance I'm going to be dead at 29. Or maybe, maybe 59 is the next one, you know. Uh, so when I got out of the hospital after a year, I became a vegetarian. I practiced yoga. I didn't drink, didn't smoke cigarettes, didn't do dope of any kind. Didn't do sugar, didn't add salt, uh, didn't eat the red meats and all that kind of stuff. I really took care of myself. I mean, for 50, the next 50 years, I was taking care of myself. So that's what makes the next near-death experience kind of interesting because as much as I took care of myself, I still had friggin' heart attacks. I was like, what? what? Anyway, so 50 years later, after this near-death experience, I finally get the opportunity to go to India and I'm 58 and a half years old. Remember, I was eight and a half. Now I'm 58 years and a half, right? And so I take this trip and I go, I got to go to Babaji's cave. I read about it, you know, 50 years ago. 
That was kind of my driving force. So I said, okay. So I went there. And when I, I went to the cave, and a beautiful, beautiful experience hiking there. There's a whole story on that. Coming back from the cave, my heart's just going boom, boom. It was like somebody with long fingernails grabbing my heart and going, <laughs> you know, it was like, uh, you know, and I'm standing on a 30 foot cliff, drops off. If it would have been a sheer drop off, it would have done more damage but it, it would drop down about 10, 12 feet, and then there was a two or three feet ledge, and then it would drop down, and it'd be a two, three, four foot ledge, and then I just kept, I bounced like three times. So I only flew eight, 10, 12 feet at a time, right? Only, right, unconscious. <laughs> so I end up on this boulder on my back. The boulder was the size of like a small Volkswagen bug. You know, it's like you're laying on the roof of a bug. It was like this big boulder. Now I'm laying up there looking at the sky and, and no more pain. I go, oh, okay, I've had this feeling before. No pain, no breath, no pulse. And once again, this is something I left out of the first story. Once again, I feel that same love because that's, that's a, a major component of a, of a near-death experience. Of almost everybody that I've met, there's a sense of you are loved. You don't have to do anything to deserve it. You're just embraced by the source. It's just the source is love. And it's just, it, it fills you with this bliss. It just, there's a difference between being comfortably happy, you know, and bliss. Told every different thing. Bliss is just, it's, you radiate love. You radiate light. You're vibrating. Your frequency is a whole different place. So there I am, and I'm, I'm looking down. Uh, again, not looking, sensing. I mean, because I don't have any eyes up there, right? But I'm above. I'm above the body, and I can tell I'm up because not only do I see the body laying there, you know, all twisted, laying there in the rock. But I also see my buddy that I was traveling with looking down at the body like, my God, there's my friend down there in the body, right? And I'm going, hey, I'm here. Of course, nobody hears you, right? And then uh, I look down and I see big, huge cobra. Big. And it's crawling across my feet, you know, and I got sandals on, you know, and it's crawling across my legs with calves and it's just it's going right over my body, right? It's coming out of this grass and it's, now, how big it is, I don't know. First time I told the story, I think I said it was six feet. And then I think the, a couple of years ago, being a, an Irishman that I am, I think things now 15 feet in my mind. It was huge. But if you have a wild cobra and you can't see where the head's at, the tail's at together, you, you can't see the whole snake. You just see it going from the grass, across you and into the grass on the other side. In your imagination, it's the biggest snake you've ever seen. It's huge, right? It's huge. So... I get so excited and filled with love for that snake, which is kind of an odd reaction. I mean, you're going to love a cobra? Yeah. It was just overwhelming love for this cobra. And it was like, it was like I had to, I had a paramedic standing over me going, Ch -ch -ch, clear, chunk. And I jumped up, <gasps> took a breath. And I'm standing and the cobra's, you know, still going over my feet. And I'm trying to grab onto the cobra and I'm going like this around the cobra and I notice the fingers aren't touching. There's there's a snake between me and, and the fingers like that. My fingers are separated about that far. So that's pretty good sized snake. I have no clue how big that that part of his body, wherever it was at, was like, and he's just slithering through my hands. And I'm chasing it through tall grass. I'm chasing a cobra through grass <laughs> with no boots on, with sandals, you know. I mean, skimpy, this pair of Levi's. And I'm chasing this thing. And it ends up going to this little waterfall. And uh, there's a little cave behind the waterfall. The waterfall is only about eight, nine feet tall. It's just a little sprigly water. And it curls up behind there and it puts its head up you know, with the tongue coming out, you know. And uh, and it, it was just mesmerizing. It was just so much love. You know? It was just, anyway. Long story, we, we end up, we find our way out of the mountain, everything happens. I I, I never went to a doctor when I was in India. I, I recovered, you know. 
and, I, and I went like three, four months later at home, and then I collapsed, had a major heart attack. I mean, it didn't fix the first one, right? So I, 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 I collapsed on my uh, garage floor. I come in, I tell my wife, I feel to go. I'm gonna go to Kaiser Hospital, you know, HMO, and and get, and get checked out. So I didn't tell her I had a heart attack, of course. You know, I, I worry her. So I get my pickup, my five-speed pickup, you know, I'm going down the highway, drive seven miles with a major heart attack going on. I get to, I get to the ER in South Sacramento and the parking lot, I've never been going to an ER, parking is like, there's no parking, everybody's taking up all the spaces and the ambulance takes up the other section. So I, I have to park like a half mile, mile away and then I walk all the way back to the ER and I get there and I walk inside because you can't go where the ambulance at. You have to walk in with the walk-in school, right? So I walk in there and there's 18 people in this line. So I stand in the line and heart's going, you know, and I'm just, and I'm just like him right now, just totally calm. I wait through 18 people ahead of me, however, you know, 15 minutes. Yeah, so I get up there and a lady hands me a clipboard, tells me to fill it out. She asks me one question. So what do you think the most important question in ER you think she'd ask? How about, how about the first and only question? Do you have insurance? Like, what? What? It didn't ask me why I was there. So I go back and, and I'm filling out the uh, six pages, six pages of questions. On the third page, there's a space about that big little square Tell us what's wrong with you. And I put down, I'm having a major heart attack currently. That's it. So I get in a second line. There's only about eight people. I finally get up there and a the nurse look at it and she takes the clipboard and she looks at it and she goes to the third page. It says here that you think you're having a heart attack. And then she asked me, how'd you get it? I said, I drove myself. I, Where'd you park? I told her where I parked. You were in that line? Yeah, you were in this line? Yeah, yeah, okay, great. I'll tell you if you're having a heart attack or not. Sit down. She takes out her stethoscope. Next thing you know, she's turned on this. I don't. I feel like I'm in the in the, in a department store. The blue light comes on or something. You know, this G code something. Boom, boom, boom. Next thing you know, there's a gurney coming out. She goes, "Sir, you're having a heart attack." And I go, "That's what I told you." So I came in. I'm having a heart. No, oh, you're really having a heart attack. I said, "I know. I, I'm having a heart attack, right?" So. I, I go in there, and then the doctor he wants to he wants to do surgery right away. You know, he wants to put in a bunch of stents, and he wants to do this and that. So I don't normally, in fact, I never complain. But this time I finally go, "Hey," I go, "What kind of what what is this?" I get up with a heart attack, and I, I go through this whole thing that I, t I told you earlier. I said, "You know, I, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I don't do sugar, I don't do I don't do caffeine, nicotine." I, I meditate, I exercise. I'm, I mean, why? Yeah, why? What, what's it? And so he looks at me and he's got my medical files and he goes, he says, well, Mr. McDonald, he says, frankly, with your genetics and your fa and your history here, you probably, if you hadn't been doing all that, you'd probably been dead at 29. I'm thinking 29. Oh. And instead of being, he looks on my birth date, which was, about the same time, you know, it's like, you know, days before my 59th birthday. And he goes, instead of almost 59. So there was a 29 and there was a 59. So then I'm thinking, I'm not out of the woods then because I still got this 29 I'm dealing with, right? So uh, just before I went to the doctors, I was contacted by my high school class for the reunion and said, who'd you want to meet at the reunion, you know, to put down the list, you know? And I said, I want to see my old friend, Paul O'Brien. Oh, Paul, he's dead. Well, Paul O'Brien and I were born the same day, an hour apart, in the same hospital in San Francisco. And I'm thinking, if there's anything with astrology, he's dead before we got to 59. He drank, he smoked, he ate red meat, he, ate the, you know, he did all that stuff, right? And I'm going, he's dead. So I'm in there a little uneasy about getting surgery. I'm like, well, you know, whatever it is, is, right? But uh, so that was the first two. There are a lot more involved in that and are, and are a lot more in depth than that. And so people can see more on those if they go to my YouTube video channel, like, cause I got a, a video on each one of those that are a lot longer. But it's this third one, the third near death experience because it entails not just having a 
out-of-body experience, but having a two-body experience. It's also about a naughty palm leaf reading that I had in predictions. So I didn't even know what that was. We'll explain. I didn't even know what that was. You know, the year before, I had no clue what that was. And it deals with predictions that were made that happened during this whole process. So there was a lot of factors there. So I'm going to, I'll start off. I made multiple trips to India. And in 2010, I was staying at an ashram outside of Pune in the jungle, this valley. And the, this guru comes to me one day and he goes, Bill, I want you to go to Pune. I want you to get a naughty palm leaf reading. I'm thinking, what is a naughty? I'm thinking, I'm naughty. You know, you read my palms, you know, a palm leaf from a palm tree. What, what are you talking about? I had no clue. So I, so I, I said, well, I don't, I don't need any fortune telling. I said, I don't believe in these things. And he says, well, they believe in you. I'm sending you. I said, well, tell me something about them. So he says, well, you got to go down here. Don't tell them your name. Don't tell them any information about you. They're going to ask you a bunch of questions, only answer yes or no. I saw him thinking some kind of mentalist act or something. I'm thinking, yeah, okay, fine. You know, all right, I, all right. He says, these things were written 2,500 to 5,000 years ago by the great Rishis, starting with Augusta. And they were written for people that would come thousands of years later or hundreds of years later or it could be more thousands in the future. And he wrote, you know, a million or two of these things. And for those people that have, have them written, they will come in when it's their time to get the reading in that particular lifetime. And I said, okay, fine. And how they find these things? They said, well, it's all done by thumbprint. And so I'm going, yeah, okay, they're going to find it by thumbprint. I said, well, they're going to run this through an FBI file and get a reading on me. Yeah, come on, you know, what is this, you know? And, and, and so, apparently, in astrology, you got 12 zodiac signs. You know, Pisces, Leo, Aries, with their personality types. Thumbprints, there's 108 variations. So there's 108 different personality types. I said, well, that's great, but if you got millions of these, that doesn't narrow down much, right? It can get down to 108, right? And... So these things are written so when you go in there and you get the reading, you will be told some piece of information will tell you that's exactly when you needed to get it. So that's so I go down there. First off, I didn't know at the time that these readings uh, were actually written on palm leaves, old palm leaves, you know. Somebody scribed it in there, and that's why they're called a palm leaf reading. And I didn't know that. And, and, and then I also didn't realize that they have to find them and they could be like in 22 or, or more cities inside of India. So they send some guy out with your fingerprint and this guy has to search for it. I'm going, I didn't know that because it could be six weeks, six months, a year, or they don't find it at all because it's not your time. So, but I figure if the guru sends me there, I'm just going to sit there until they get it, right? <laughs> like, you know, okay, you know, it could take six months. I didn't know that. So I get there, I give my thumper, and I'm sitting there about two hours later, and they come and get me. And he brings out this whole stack of them, what they call a bundle. And there's uh, probably about 15, 16, 20 of them in a the bundle. And he goes through the first six, and he gets the seventh one, and he goes, my intuition says the seventh one is yours. They ask you these questions. If you say no to any of them, then they take or set it aside. They just keep going to laws are, laws are, I mean, you can answer 30 right, but you know, they come to number 31, it's, nope, that's not you. Wait, what? Anyway, so he goes, your name is four letters long. I go, yes. That's the name I use. So I don't explain anything to him, but I go by Bill. Well, in, in reality, if you look at my, you know, passport or something it says William, right? Everything's William. Nobody, there's no Williams in the world. Every William goes by Bill. I mean, I'm, you, know, you know, unless they're a royal family, maybe they're William. But the rest of us are Bill, right? So I said, okay. I, I go, yes. I don't give any explanation. And he goes, it starts with a B. I go, yes. And then he goes, Bill, it's Bill. I go, yes. 
And he says, and your father's name was, was meaning he's dead, exactly the same as yours. I'm William H. McDonald Jr. He's William H. McDonald Sr. So there you go, it's exactly the same, right? So, and then he goes, your mother's name is Marcella. And your wife's name is Carol. And then he goes to the whole thing of the children and this and that, and you write books, you do this, that. And then he goes, and there's one question here we're going to give you because if you say yes to this, then this is the right time for you to be here. He says, according to this piece of information I have here, he says, you recently worked on a play, but he says, intuitively, they didn't, they didn't know about movies back then. <laughs> you know, you know, he says, my, my, my intuition says, you recently worked on a movie, but not as a movie, not, a, not as an actor. And only, well, I'm the only one that was in India that knew that because a few weeks before I went there, I helped, I helped us get a new ending for a movie trooper uh, and gave it a different, you know, I suggested it to the writers and they, they rewrote it. And anyway, it was a, it was, it was a big deal because it saved the picture. It was really kind of neat. And, uh, but nobody knew that. So I thought, wow, if I'd come in here next year, this wouldn't be ringing true because it wouldn't be recent. And if I came in last year, I wouldn't even know what they were talking about. So, so then he proceeds and he, after he gives us all this information and he goes, your birthday is March 16th, 1946. And I'm going, what? I say, what? <laughs> I go, yes. I go, yeah. He says, but we're unsure of the exact time. I go, oh, they're human. They don't know, right? And he goes, he goes, we think it's between like 110, 15, and uh, 120, maybe 125, someplace in the AM, right? What they didn't know was when I was born, my mother went into the hospital, San Francisco, told me she was getting ready to deliver, and they go, no, nah, I'm gonna give you an enema first, and you're, you're good. And of course, when the enema's going on, this bedpan, this metal bedpan's filling up with crap, boom, born right into the bedpan, head first, mouth full of shit. That's how I started my life off. But see, they didn't know that story. And so then they, they, they didn't let me get all the way out. You know, it's like, you know, well, you know, we got the doctor there because he's got to get paid for the delivery, right? I mean, if the nurses delivered it, it was like, so when the doctor come, he goes, well, what was the birth time? And they go, well, between 110 or so and 125. And then he just took something in the middle. And that's what these guys did. They said, well, we're going to take this time. And so when I heard their times, the same time I got on my uh, birth certificate. So I said, so I'm saying, okay, fine, it's the it matches. So then they went through hours later, and they and they told me about my past life, uh, a significant past life, and how I left in a rainbow body, and a whole bunch of other stuff. That's another whole story. Then they told, gave me about 25 predictions or so for when I leave there till the end of the reading. And the reading only went from 2010 to 2020. They said the great danger in 2020, if you go to India, you'll never return home. You'll be dead. And and there's no more reading after that. So I have to assume that unless, unless they said, unless the great ones, Babaji, Lord Shiva, your guru, somebody extends your life, unless it's extended for their purpose, not yours, that 2020 is your exit time. Apparently 2020 was the exit time for a lot of people in this world. You know, it was like, anyway, so for 10 years, they can, from 2010 to 2020, I'm thinking, uh, maybe this, maybe I just got a decade left, you know? So that was kind of an interesting thing. Then when COVID hit, I'm going, I ain't leaving the house. I'm wearing my mask. I mean, I'm, I'm easy, you know, I'll just do, I'll, I'll do a lot of uh, Zoom stuff. And that's where I started doing my videos. And I ended up with a million and a half views you know, sitting at my house, I'm going, I'm, I'm more famous when I'm not out of the house, you know, it's like, I get bigger crowds. Anyway, so, so they made, they made a bunch of predictions, but two of the predictions that they made were bizarre, which is really weird. They go, uh, this was 2010 when I had it done. I ended up going back the next year, 2011, because my thing said, you will go in 2011 and you'll be in India and you're in Southern India and you'll go to this Shiva temple. And when you get there, because you're supposed to be at this temple. There'll be a hill, and you'll walk up that hill two to four hours. When you get to the top, 
there's all these, all the rishis will be waiting for you sitting on around a fire and you won't ask any questions because you'll remember everything. You'll know all the answers already. And then they went into a bunch of stuff that would happen. And then the other prediction they made that I thought was odd, they said, you know, sometime that, you know, Babaji or Lord Shiva would come and anoint you with, with oil and water and, and pray for you. And and I thought, okay, so I thought it was all symbolic. And, uh, and since I had my, when I went 2011 back to India, you know, thinking, well, I'll go to this, the temple. And then I had a major heart attack there and ended up leaving India and, and then collapsing at the airport in Denver. <laughs> Six hours treatment with the paramedics. They put me back on the airplane to fly to Sacramento to go to the doctor. I couldn't believe they let me do that because I ended up with blood clots and everything, of course. I mean, it was like, what? Anyway, so now we're going to get down to the story of the, the third near-death experience. That's just the background, but it fits in. It fits in. So I end up back in Sacramento needing quadruple bypass surgery. And we're talking, they're going to rip your chest open and heart lung machine, and the whole thing, right? I mean, major stuff. I'm so weak by the time I get to the hospital because I've been flying halfway around the world, literally. I mean, day and a half to get there. So uh, I'm put immediately into ICU, four or five days in ICU before they even do anything to me. Just stabilize me because I was, they couldn't operate because I was like, coming and going or something, I don't know. So finally, they transport me by an ambulance to a, a place where I gotta do the surgery. And at six o'clock in the morning, I'm taken into this room. I'm totally naked. I'm, I'm wrapped in the thinnest sheet that you could ever have. I had a thread, the thread count on it must've been two, you know, instead of, instead of 500 or a thousand, it's like two, it was like nothing, right? And all the doctors are bundled up like with ski jackets on with their, you know, their doctor stuff to protect, you know, getting the blood out on the outside of it. And they're all bundled up, right? And I'm laying on this metal table, butt naked, and I'm going, good grief, man. Of course, you know, I'm admonished and go, geez, man, you know, you, yeah, you don't worry about it, doctor. Yeah, don't worry about it. I said, well, tell me what's, what's going to happen. And he goes, the guy with no bedside banner goes, uh, picks up this device and it looks like if you ever done any gardening, you know, pruning shears, like getting branches. So first off, he says, I'll, I'll take a knife and I'm going to cut, cut you open. And then I'm going to, then I'm going to take this. And he holds this thing and he goes, click, 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 click like that. He says, and I'm going to cut your ribs. I, I go, what? <laughs> what? And he says, and then he shows me this, this chest, you know, expander, you know? And so, this is how I remember it. I think it, I, I couldn't remember that, right? Is, it, is that all true? I don't know. It's like, that's how I remember all this, right? And then he shows me this thing, and then we're going to hold your chest open. He says, and he says, and then we're going to cut your artery, go into your heart. We're going to stop your heart. We're going to run your blood into this machine. It's a heart-lung machine. So your blood will be going in this machine. It'll be oxygenated. We're going to stop your lungs. We're going to stop your heart. I go, well, if my heart's not beating and I'm not breathing, I'm dead. And he goes, yeah, we're going to kill you first. I go, I didn't think that was funny. I'm going, really? He goes, I don't worry about it. As long the machine's still working, we're okay. I go, okay, fine. So that's what kind of mood I'm in, right? And then I go, well, I'm on this heart lung machine. I said, is that going to affect me anyway? And he says, well, he says, yeah, actually, he says, we have to cut back on the uh, on the dosage of, uh, of uh, what's the word I'm looking at? Anesthesia. We can't. We can't get you too deep because you're on this heart lung machine, so minimal. He says, oh, a few people once in a while say they felt something. So that was my feeling as I'm getting ready to go unconscious, right? And then he gives me this shot, you know, and uh, and, I, and it was like two, three seconds, boom, it's black. And now I am totally transformed, not an out-of-body experience, looking at myself, you know, floating around in the ether as a light being or a consciousness. No, I am standing instantly. I'm standing where I was told I was going to be that year, that month, because it was supposed to be that month I was going to be there. Uh, but I ended up in the hospital, right? So I am standing there in a, in a cobblestone 
square, you know, a little area in front of this temple. And I look at it and I see it's a, Lord, it's a Shiva temple and I'm going, oh, but this, this is a place. I just know this is the place I'm supposed to be, right? And then I'm thinking, I'm standing here and people breathe it on me and I feel the sunshine and I feel people bump it into me. Um, so what's the first thought I have? Do I have any clothes on? It's like, I, I left, I was naked, right? So when I had clothes on, right? I'm like, okay, great, so I'm good. But it was like, I'm not there as a dream spirit or a, or a uh, esoteric soul floating around. I'm actually there solid in a body. And so I look at this hill and I'm going, well, uh, it's supposed to be a six to eight hour long operation. What else am I going to do? Go for a walk. It's like, go for a walk. Right? I, I mean, I'm in another, I'm in my body, but it's, it's I got a body laying on the table. There's two bodies we're dealing with here. And I'm going, who cares? I don't, I don't need an explanation. Let's just go with it, right? So I start walking up the hill. Who knows how long in time it was. I mean, there's no time in this kind of thing. But it, it was whatever it was. And uh, I come to the top of this hill. And there, sitting around a sacred fire, a pit with stones, you know. And then there's some stumps and some rocks. There's these... 18 rishis and the guru that sent me for a reading he's there too standing the rest of them all sitting and I walk up there and they you know to join them right and it was right I had no questions uh, I knew everything that I could ask it was really just everything was predicted happened I'm gonna kind of roll past that but when I see the guru guy he looks at me and he goes Neil you could skip a few beats but don't give up heart. I go, what? He says, no, skip a few beats, but don't give up heart. Well, see, I was in so much pain and suffering, and this was like my about ninth or tenth uh, heart attack, major heart attack, and plus all the other stuff I had going on in my life. I mean, it was, you know, this was a major thing. So, <laughs> and I was in pain, and I'm going, um, I, I've been on the other side. I know it was, it was nice over there. I, you know, this is... I don't want to stick around for more pain and suffering, right? So then there's clouds reappear. Ah, remember the clouds, right? From the first first near death experience. So there's clouds. And I hear this voice. It, it, angelic voice. It's really weird, but when you get an angelic voice, it's always a beautiful, soft, feminine. You're imagining this most beautiful woman, you know, feminine uh, spirit of some kind talking to you. There's just this beautiful sound. And she goes, Bill, you've done everything you're supposed to do. You don't owe anybody anything. You don't have any karmic debt. You uh, come with me. Just give up your breath. Just come. I promise you peace, love, joy, bliss, happiness beyond measure. You get to rest. You don't have to do anything for anybody. You don't owe anybody anything. And then the guru keeps interrupting her and going, Bill, you can skip a few beats, but don't give up heart right now. Go, come on. I said, she's promised me love. She's promised me bliss. What do you promise me, you know, not to go? And then he kind of raises his hands, points to this clouds. And in the cloud, I see this never ending panorama of people's faces. Men, women, old, young, black, Asian, white, Hispanic, everything. And then an occasional dog or occasional cat or occasional bird or some other animal. But it was like, people, people. And he goes, you don't owe these people anything. But if you don't go back, they will lose something. They will not get the gift that you could give them. Whether it's a smile, a healing, encouragement, stop a suicide, whatever it is, you know, just a lot of a lot of different gifts. But if you're not there, they're not going to get the message. And yeah, it wasn't enough. I'm going, no, no, no. And what else you promised me? And he says that I promise you more pain than you've ever had in your entire life. And I go. I go, what kind of sales pitch is that? She's saying, no, no more pain, peace, love, bliss. And you're saying, you've got to give me greater pain than I've ever had before. 
He says, yes, before you had pain, but you would just use yoga. You'd use techniques, boom, you'd bliss out. Pain's gone, boom. He says, but now you're going to be like a real person. You're going to feel every pain and pain will be worse than it ever was. And then you're going to have to learn how to deal with that pain so you can teach them mental, spiritual, and physical pain beyond measure. I'm going, it's not enough for me, man. I'm going, I'm sorry, man. Just, you know. And then next thing you know, it's like I'm feeling somebody like hands in my body or my chest or something. And all of a sudden, obviously somebody did the uh, clear, you know, somebody did the restart, right? And next thing you know, boom, I'm, I'm off the mountaintop. That body's dissolved. I'm now awakened in this body, this tortured body on this operating table. They got me strapped down, got my, got tape over my eyes. They got a tube down my throat, I can't talk, and it's taped. And uh, I feel absolutely everything they're doing. And in my mind, I'm saying, hey, hey, doc, I feel everything. Hey, hey, whoa, 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 what we? And then I hear the anesthesiologist, my guest that said it, because I couldn't see anybody, but I believe it was the anesthesiologist. He goes, hey, doc, he goes, uh, the anesthesia just wore off. I think he can feel everything that's going on. And the guy goes, I think I remember this. He goes, oh, we only got another 40, 45 minutes to go. Let go. And I'm going, I'm hearing this. And I'm feeling it. I'm going, 45 minutes. Come on. You know, I can't talk. I can't scream. Inside, I'm screaming and going, hey, hey. So I was promised if I came back, I would get more pain. It started immediately. And so they're still putting me back together. And, and they're wiring, you know, the rib cage back together and wrapping the wires, doing all this stuff. And they're stapling and stitching and doing all. I mean, I feel it all. I go, holy cow. All right, so normally you have heart surgery. And nowadays, because of insurance companies, don't want to pay nothing. Four days, you're out, man. Four or five days, they kick you out. Right? I mean, you drag home. You, that. Well, I've already been there like five days. I'm there almost a month, about three and a half weeks later, I'm still there. Five blood transfusions. I'm just going downhill, downhill. And every time I close my eyes, every time I, I, I'd go into a dreamlike vision state, but when I closed my eyes and drifted off, I was back on the mountaintop. I was back on the hill. Mountain's a big word. It's more like a hill. I'm back on this hill, sitting with these guys, enjoying this fire, and have this whole thing about the debate going on. You skip a few beats, don't give up heart, I promise you love, I, you know, this whole thing going back and forth. But every time for like the next 11, 12, 15 days, every day, I'm getting that every day, every time I go to sleep. So finally, a couple days before I got checked out, I was, I was really bad. It was like 10.30 at night, they come put me on a gurney, they're gonna take me down to an emergency procedure, give me some more blood, and the Bedside phone rings the landline. And I said, I gotta answer it. And the guy goes, No, no. I said, No, I gotta answer this. Oh no, I gotta answer this. So they saw I was upset, said, Okay, answer it. And I hear this voice going, Bill, this is Gornoff in India. Like, how many Gornoffs do I know? Right? It was like, okay, he narrowed it down. So and then he says, You can skip a few beats, but don't give a part. And I go, What'd you say? He says, You can skip a few beats but don't give a part. I go, what? What? Because <laughs> that's what's been said to me every single day, right? And and then he goes, that's still not enough. To, I'm still wanting to check out. I'm, I'm ready to go. And then he goes, Bill, I just sent 100 people up to the temple. I told them I was going to heal you. Don't you embarrass me. I mean, don't die. <laughs> Embarrassing. <laughs> okay, right? I go, oh. Oh, okay, so I guess I gotta get out of here. Shit, pressure. So, the day before I leave, remember that other prediction about Babaji or Lord Shiva coming and anointing me with stuff? Well, I'm laying in bed, and there's like this dome of light, like a crystal dome, little sparkly lights of energy. It's over the bed, and I can't see anything outside of that. At the, at the end of my bed, there's Babaji, long black hair, shiny skin, no shirt, no shoes, 
but he's got Levi's. This is an American. It's my, it's my vision. Yeah, he's got, he's got Levi's on, right? He's got jeans. And, and he's reaching the other, from the end of that bed. The bed's got to be seven foot long hospital bed, right? At least seven feet or more. And he's reaching over and he's pouring oil and water on my forehead. And he's chanting some exotic language. And I'm just blissed out. And I'm going, wow, this is really cool. I said, well, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm doped up or something. Maybe I'm, who knows? Uh, I'm enjoying, nobody will ever believe me. This is my own thing, who cares? I'm gonna enjoy it, right? So I'm blissed out. All right, I get home from the hospital and my, my daughter comes over and she goes, hey, dad, you know, uh, our old neighbor, you know, Dave, he, he went to see you on, uh, you know, the day before he left. And I go, no, he didn't. He says, oh yeah, yeah, he told me about it. I said, he told me that uh, he went in there and uh, you saw this young Indian guy with no shirt on and no shoes on, pouring stuff on your head, chanting some crazy stuff. And he started to laugh, but he didn't want to embarrass you. So he left. I'm going, so I told her what happened, right? And she goes, how could he see that? I said, I don't know. But it was kind of like the source telling me, no, what you saw was seen by somebody else. So it kind of verified it for me what happened. So that was my third near-death experience. And uh, each one of them were different. They were unique. They came at a time in my life where it felt like it was time to change directions. And I was able to accomplish that. And uh, I think most people that have near-death experiences, it, it has changed them in some way. Depending on their degree of frequency and vibration and where they're at spiritually um, how they how they translate it so I, I believe that the source the, the divine will give you what you're comfortable seeing and believing because obviously a Hindu would have a different experience than a, than a Jewish person than a Christian you know whatever I think it would reflect your beliefs um, the divine is very good at giving you what you, what makes you comfortable and what lessons you need but I think everybody agrees on this, unconditional love. It's there. It's, if you got to describe the whole experience and just be, it's just love. When you come back, it's like, that's not important. That's small stuff. That's small stuff. You know, it's, it's only about love. And for those that have been successful with that experience, meaning they've taken it and they've used that experience as a stepping stone to self-evolve, bless them because that's all, it's, it's, it's basically a download for them, it gives them another level of understanding. And when people share these things, it also gives people that have not had them that are maybe uncomfortable with death approaching for themselves. They realize, well, there is no death. There's just change of frequency and it's all about love. So there you go. That's the three near-death experiences, but that is the tip of the iceberg of my life on this, on the supernatural mystical journey I'm on. That's just like, yeah, okay, that's just, that's called Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, those three things. I mean, it's just like, boom, but there's all this other stuff that's just as neat, you know, so it just is what it is. First off, if they find my YouTube channel, Rev Bill McDonald, just like it's on the bottom of the screen. Hopefully it'll be on my, my picture there. If you just type that in on YouTube, you'll find hundreds of, uh, uh, well, there's probably 1,500 or 1,800 podcast interviews. I mean, it's just all over the place. I mean, literally. Uh, but on my own channel, there's 190 some videos and all but a dozen of them are, are, are be, you know, singular. Uh, I've interviewed about a dozen people I thought were interesting, but other than that, I got uh, videos on my experiences in war, uh, amazing, spectacular things. I got, I talk about miracles, I talk about love. So, YouTube channel, great place to explore. And if they want to go, RevBillMcDonald.com, there you go. You're right on my website. Or you can get me on Facebook. Believe it or not, it's called Rev Bill McDonald as well. I try to make it easy for me to remember. So, it's, it's all Rev Bill McDonald. So they can get me there, or if, they, if they're they in the client to uh, want to read my life stories, uh, I got several books out and they go to Amazon and uh, they can read my autobiography, which is a warrior, a spiritual warrior's journey, 
uh, that was my first one. Then there was Warrior uh, uh, a Spiritual Odyssey. And then there's uh, Alchemy uh, of a Warrior's Heart. But anyway, the, if they go, they'll find these things and they'll see references to them. And, and I do respond to email requests uh, for prayers and whatever. Uh, Huey, H-U-E-Y, 576 at gmail.com. So Huey, like the Huey helicopter, 576, that was my Huey helicopter. 576 was the tail number. So Huey576 at gmail.com. If you write, be patient. I get about a thousand uh, emails a day, but I do respond. You might get a real long response. You might get, you're in my prayers. You might get something simple. You might get a couple recommendations to watch a video, uh, but you always have my thoughts and prayers. So, and forgive me if I if it, it takes a couple of days for me to respond because I have to get up at two or three in the morning to answer all my my messages. Yeah. God bless.